Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this uh, edition of Market Happy Hour. Um, we're uh, pleased that you've taken the time out of your day to uh, spend some time with us to hear our views of the market, what's going on today, and also our views for the future. Um, before we begin, I point out a disclaimer, uh, and if you uh, take the time to read this, it'd be great. Um, basically says you not reproduce or share this without the approval of, of Capital Wealth Advisors. My name is Bill Bynan. I'll be your host today. I'm joined today by our, my partner and our chief investment officer, Lewis Johnson, as well as Zev Abraham, our director of research. Before we begin, as always, uh, please feel free as we go along in the discussion. We, we want this to be interactive. If you have questions, submit them to the question and answer section, um, and we will get to as many of those as possible. For some reason, if we don't get to your question live, we will um, be uh, answering those offline uh, in a very timely fashion for you. And at the end, if you would be so kind to complete our exit survey, uh, this allows us to get your feedback and it helps us uh, try to constantly improve uh, the uh, market happy hours based on your feedback. And it's been very helpful for us and you'll see some of those points today. So, Today, uh, if you've been following the markets, we're going to talk about what's happening today in the markets. You know, I think the, the big picture is we are short-term cautious and long-term bullish. Um, there certainly are cyclical forces bearing down on the world economy. The dollar strength is bad um, for debtors as well as for corporate earnings. We're going to spend some time talking about that and giving some examples. The Fed right now is between a rock and a hard place. We have inflation. Uh, we have a narrative being being talked about daily with inflation. The market, though, is already beginning to discount uh, the end of the tightening cycle. So as we think about the decisions the Fed is making, we're trying to look ahead of that and look at what the market is telling us about um, the tightening cycle that we're, we're experiencing today. Our positioning is defensive, but we're really preparing for the next uh, leaders of the next cycle. What winners are going to be there as this tightening cycle ends? Uh, typically, and Lewis will share this with you, that the, the leaders of this cycle are not the leaders uh, of the cycle before. We're going to show you some data to that and kind of give you our views on what that looks like. So, uh, Lewis, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Lewis is joining us today from the mountains of Georgia. So uh, you, lo you look well rested, Lewis. I uh, hope the trip is going well. Uh, I'll turn it over to you and we'll, we'll start with uh, Chinese real estate market. Sure, sure. Well, good afternoon again, and thanks everybody for taking the time to, to join us and kind of learn about um, some of the things that we are looking into uh, active in the research team. So what we'd like to do really is to kind of let you kind of look over our shoulders, see the things that we kind of care about and how that is um, kind of driving how we think about the markets and how we're positioned. So uh, before we get too deep into it, what I'd just like to highlight um, is kind of what we think has been kind of driving the weakness that we've seen in markets for basically a year now. We really think it started with the Chinese real estate market. Uh, for those of you that are active participants in this market happy hour, you may recall we did one of these a year ago, kind of a, a deep dive with a, an author, Denny McMahon, to talk about weakness in the Chinese real estate, which in fact is still continuing today. So what we wanted to demonstrate with this headline was just that um, that single factor that we did outline basically a year ago is really still driving uh, what we think is kind of a, a global slowdown. And uh, frankly, there's no signs of it, um, you know, look, looking better at this point. And this is another way to demonstrate that. Uh, this is the price chart of um, the bonds that are used to fund, you know, um, Chinese property development. And you can see that they've frankly kind of crashed, fallen apart. This is, this is bad for the uh, prospects of return growth in the Chinese property market because it means their interest rates are really, really high and that the market deems this sector is very risky, which we would agree with. So, uh, so for us, what this means is that even though we have had a defensive posture for some time, we kind of continue to maintain it uh, as this leading edge of global weakness continues to deteriorate. And Lewis, I'd point out to, to uh, those online today, You'll note on all of the charts today, we have a red, red outline box. And, and those are where we're highlighting for you the key takeaways from each chart that we're going through. Uh, this is a direct response to your feedback. Want to make sure that, that you have a clear understanding of the point that we're trying to make with each one of the charts. So keep in mind to take a look at that either now as we're going through or later if you watch it as a recorded presentation. 
Yeah, thanks, Bill, for uh, for highlighting that. And I would just add to Bill's comments that we uh, we do uh, pay close attention to all your comments, and so please let us know how we can improve uh, our time together in these market happy hours. Well, another point we'd like to make, kind of continuing on with what's really kind of going on in the markets. Uh, remember, the first point we were making is that this weakness did start in China. The second point we'd like to make is the weakness is emanating outward from China to parts of the rest of the world. And here we demonstrate this through credit default swaps. So um, take a look at COVID, for instance, which of course was that big spike in the middle um, from March of 2020. And you can see that uh, the green line is kind of leading us up. That is in fact um, an index of credit default swaps in Asia. Uh, Europe is a fast second and the US the third is lagging. So this is, you know, this is not a problem that we, we really started in terms of here in the US. But of course, these global markets are interconnected. So, um, you know, we have to kind of deal with this risk. The final point I would make um, is that basically this is a, a very unique down cycle. You have to go all the way back to the Asian crisis of 97 and 98 to see uh, a time when Asia was not a, a sign of strength, but frankly, an area of weakness which is where we find ourselves at this point. We think our portfolios are set up appropriately, but just understand that this is kind of a different down cycle for that reason. So Lewis, as we think about credit default swaps, just to, not to oversimplify, but I always, I always uh, listen to, to uh, our clients say sometimes keeping it very simple is important. Uh, just to reiterate, as credit default swap, the, that green spike, basically think about it, it's, it's the price uh, to ensure the credit uh, of an area and the higher the price, the more likely it is to default. Um, yeah, exactly. It's the, it's the price of insurance against default. So as the, the price is rising, it demonstrates that the market is becoming increasingly concerned about the credit worthiness of, frankly, you know, this is an investment grade, uh, an index of investment grade bonds throughout Asia. So it's a very broad index that shows very broad concerns. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to think about that. We're not talking about high yield or high risk bonds. These are investment grade. That's right. And um, in this chart, uh, the higher you see those uh, lines, the worse uh, potentially the market is seeing from, from the credit worthiness of those. So I just thought I'd point that out. Well, yeah, and while we're on that topic, uh, Bill, if you could have it uh, just on that chart one more time. Uh, the other thing I'd like to highlight is you can see how in mid-2021, the kind of green line started moving first. That was when we really started to talk about problems of uh, the Chinese property market. And you can see it basically festered for six or eight months while things continued to do fine in the U.S. and in Europe until early 2022. So this is why we you know, believe very strongly that the kind of current bound of financial weakness that's uh, hitting the world really did begin in Asia. Um, so the problems may have begun in Asia, but there are they're clearly problems now in, in Europe. You know, uh, here's a, a perfect example of, of kind of the strange world that the Europeans are finding themselves in. Remember that um, Germany gets 20 to 30 percent of its energy from Russia, which has now been cut off, basically. So uh, this is a headline demonstrating that the largest um, uh, you know, rental or landlord company, excuse me, in Germany is now turning the heat down. Uh, in terms of the electricity availability for Europe. We think we're gonna hear more of this, frankly, uh, as we get deeper into the summer and as winter approaches. So um, so Europe is, is frankly not as um, capable as US in kind of dealing with some of the, uh, the struggles that we're facing. One way to demonstrate kind of how the Europeans are kind of dealing with this, this shows the, the spread. This is the premium that the market is demanding to fund Italian debt over uh, German debt. And the reason this is the topic we wanted to highlight is that Europe has a, a structural weakness if we don't, which is that, um, you know, basically the currency that they set up is very poorly um, constructed. And then during times of stress, what you tend to see is this fragmentation within Europe where basically um, as credit risk rise, some of the weaker sovereigns in Europe become much less credit worthy and this problem can feed on itself. So, so far we're starting, you know, we are still under the levels that we saw in COVID, but we're watching this with some interest, particularly uh, in Italy, which is the world's third largest sovereign bond bar. So this we think is gonna be something we'll have to pay close attention to as we go through. And Lewis, if my memory uh, serves me correct, that we saw this back in 2011 in Italy, 
uh, you know, with weakness at the same time. So this is not a new story. This is something, this reaction happens because of the construct of the currency in the euro. No, that's a really good point, Bill. Um, the wrinkle here is that um, because um, this kind of deglobalization shock has got prices up so materially that the world's central banks are kind of scrambling to try to raise the price of money basically to slow the economy down, which is all they're really capable of doing at this point in the short run. Um, but as the Europeans are doing that right now, um, the European economy is just not set up as well as the U.S. economy to kind of take that shock. So we do think that as the price of money gets raised in Europe, that we're going to see more and more of this fragmentation of risk grow in Europe. Yeah, we were talking about it today. I mean, you're starting to see sort of politicians get ousted in, in some of these countries. You, your prediction, I think, was the Italian uh, government could change over at any point in time. Um, That's correct. You know, as, as deglobalization really sweeps through the world. Uh, well, you, you, see it. You, know, you have to understand that the ECB, um, you know, solved this problem by buying the debt of Italy and some of the weaker currencies. So now as they're raising rates and they're trying to, um, to tighten conditions, that it, it's very difficult for them to do that anymore. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the spread rise. And we expect that it could rise a lot, a lot more. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, thanks Seth, for making that point. So of course, there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, this is an index uh, showing the dollar's value relative to a set of trade weighted uh, currencies. Uh, you know, there are many people, in our opinion, which we've steadfastly kind of fought against this one view in terms of in inflation. Uh, there's no question we've had a very real and ruinous increase in the cost of living. This has not been caused highly unlikely like the 70s, which was driven by extreme dollar weakness. This is incredible dollar strength. Um, and so what we wanted to demonstrate with this chart is just basically how strong the dollar has been. I think it's now rallied 15 or 20 percent relative to uh, currencies throughout the world. Uh, and the reason we wanted to highlight this, we'll talk about this for a little bit, is that something like 60 percent of all the debt in the world is, in fact, in dollars. So what this means is, particularly for emerging market economies, and we'll show this, I suppose, on the next chart, that uh, as the dollar rises, this has a direct impact on uh, making it more difficult for these countries to pay the debts back. And so putting in layman's terms, Lewis, if they're producing in their local currency and their debts are denominated in the dollar, they have negative spread um, mm -hmm. on on their uh, on their on their uh, profits. Yeah, well, that, that's right. So of course, if they're if they're operating uh, in an emerging market economy and they're like in Argentine pesos or something, for instance. But their debts are in dollars, the weaker, say, the peso gets, the more and more difficult it becomes for them to pay back that dollar debt, which means the interest rates on that debt, which are becoming increasingly suspect, are going to go up, which makes it even more difficult for those debts to be paid off. So this can be a very much a circular reference. And it's underway right now, which is what the second chart demonstrates. Um, you know, here we were just reiterating the same point that we made, which is that um, uh, the dollar is very strong and as it is rising. Uh, it is uh, the market is responding by pricing in ever higher interest rates in terms of the cost to borrow uh, for, in this case, emerging market sovereigns relative to the U.S. Treasury market. So U.S. rates are going up, it's true, but they're going up even faster, uh, particularly in the emerging market world. And I wouldn't be uh, surprised if this ends up kind of creating extreme credit distress uh, in these weaker economies. Now, um, here we demonstrate that a stronger dollar can be, um, you know, paradoxically something that um, can mitigate against a strong U.S. Uh, stock market performance because many U.S. companies, and here we list kind of the top 10 market cap wise, have a large portion of their revenues to be derived from uh, their businesses outside the U.S. So in some cases, this, uh, as we show here, it could be as high as 80 percent of the revenue of some of these um, companies are outside of our shores. So remember that a key point that we're making is that a large part of the weakness we're seeing in the world has really been started and driven by factors outside of our shores. This means that some of these large companies uh, could be facing this headwind of uh, weaker economies outside the U.S. that are hurting their fundamentals. Louis, Evan, I were talking earlier, you know, if you look at this chart with the exception of United Healthcare, um, these companies have a substantial portion of their, their earnings are outside the U.S., um, so, in, 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 you know, many times people say, well, I have a U.S. dominated portfolio. I don't have a lot of exposure to foreign 
foreign investments. But the reality is if you own the S&P 500, you really do uh, because cool. the economy is globalized. So we can't just look at it anymore in the lens of U.S. versus non-U.S. You have to peel back the onion and understand the U.S. companies that we're investing in, how much exposure they really have to foreign revenue. And we're seeing slowdowns in, in, in an area like Europe. You know, what, what effect will that have on the U.S. markets going forward? Yeah, that's a great point, Bill. Thanks. For yeah, and, and just on the conversion, right? If you're at fifty percent of your revenues in a currency that's down twenty percent of the dollar uh, against the dollar, that equals a ten percent hit right there to your revenue number. Mm-hmm. Okay. So and if your and if your revenue, to Zev's point, if your revenue is declining ten percent, then the profitability of your enterprise is probably going down even faster. Yeah. So now let's talk a little bit about. Um, about inflation, this has been uh, kind of a hot topic. Uh, the Fed clearly is very focused on it. Here, what we demonstrate uh, is that this is one important market-based measure where uh, the inflation rate that the market uh, is pricing in right now is actually declining. It's down by 30% over the last four to six weeks. Uh, so what this, uh, with the green line here, what this demonstrates is this is the, um, what the market's expectation is for the forward inflation rate over the next five years. Uh, And you can see that in fact, there was a big crash during COVID where uh, the market was basically pricing in, you know, no inflation. And then of course we've had a, uh, you know, tremendous increase in that. But the point that we want to make is the market's always looking ahead. What matters is frankly not today. What matters is what the world looks like six to 12 months from now. And so what we'd like to demonstrate is that this meaningful reversal that we are seeing in the what the market is pricing in for the inflation expectation. This is a key reason uh, that we are set up defensively for the back half of the year and why we think that uh, bonds should be a, a, a hub to the traditional role of diversifying an equity rich portfolio, particularly in the back half of the year. If this trend continues, which is the market pricing in a lower rate of, of inflation expectation. Lewis, how much of that is, in, in your opinion, driven by the moves that the Fed has made, or is the market just simply running through the cycle? No, that look, that's a really good that's a good question, Bill. There's no question that um, that the, the Fed's very aggressive stance is starting to you know mitigate some economic growth, which you know which uh, typically has some kind of inflationary component. But a, a big part of that reversal and decline. Um, you know, has really, frankly, begun with what we believe is a downturn in the industrial economy. We saw this first in the scrap steel market in Turkey, where that market has actually been cut in half. The price of physical scrap steel in Turkey has been cut in half since April 20th, uh, which we think is uh, demonstrative of um, the beginning of what we've called an inventory destocking cycle. Uh, And here, not to belabor this point, but think back about what your experience was when you walked into a grocery store during COVID. Uh, and, you know, many of the stores, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the, um, they were bare, particularly of toilet paper. And I would submit that, you know, toilet, the actual use of toilet paper probably didn't go up that much during COVID, but people walked into a store, saw that they were almost out of toilet paper. And so basically it created this hoarding mentality where uh, if your bathroom is like, <laughs> it's like mine, there's a little extra toilet paper in it because people didn't want to run out. Well, the same thing, frankly, happened in the industrial economy, uh, and there was a tremendous amount of hoarding uh, as people were afraid they would not be able to get the products that they wanted. Uh, we think this is resolving itself now with excess supply, and frankly, I would put the date for that turning as April 20th when uh, the price of physical scrap steel began what's now 50% collapse. Um, so we've seen this many times. It's the seventh inventory destocking cycle I've traded in my career. Uh, and so I would be willing to bet you that that's one of the forces at work that has kind of broken the back of that inflation expectation. And I think it will endure. So, so Lewis, you know, having traded or seen followed seven destocking cycles, um, what's the typical length of a destocking cycle? And do you feel mm-hmm. because of the extreme, uh, I'll use the word hoarding of inventory that happened coming through COVID, do you see this destocking cycle longer than normal? normal? Um, how long does it take to work through that? That's a really good question, Bill. So the two aspects of that, um, well, yeah, so first of all, this is the seventh inventory stocking cycle I've traded. Uh, I've seen them be as short as eight weeks. I've seen them be as long as two years. It's really a function of 
Uh, two things. Number one is how extreme was inventory hoarding? And by any measure, I would say this has been by far the greatest. Yeah. The last example that came anywhere close to this, frankly, was those of us who were old enough to remember the Y2K panic when all the, you know, the clocks were going to, um, because they didn't have four digits or whatever, we were all going to, uh, we we're all going to die and all the computers weren't going to work. So everybody bought a little extra ahead of that. So that inventory destocking cycle peaked in January of 2000. Uh, and the economy and the markets weren't great for the next two years as we worked through that excess. I would argue that this has been far more extreme in almost every measure that I look at. The other thing I would say, um, if you just look mathematically, like I said, uh, typically inventory destocking cycles, they always are terrifying in terms of data falling apart. The data is, in fact, falling apart at this point. Um, but they don't necessarily have to kind of end the cycle. So we're kind of open-minded about this. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we took the precautionary view to be conservatively positioned going into this. Uh, and frankly, while we've done you know, uh, uh, well on a relative basis during this kind of slowdown. Uh, so, uh, so basically the odds are typically only one in three that an inventory stocking cycle does mark the end of the cycle. Um, you know, again, we're gonna uh, err on the side of being cautious for two reasons. One is that the scope of the restocking cycle has been completely unprecedented. So we think that this pulled forth a lot of demand that um, is going to be weak and, and not there in the back half of the year, kind of number one. And, uh, and number two, we think that the actions of the Fed in terms of, of really frankly panicking with uh, the fastest rate of interest rate hikes ever, we think this could really uh, complicate, elongate whatever demand slowdown we see as these excessive inventories get worked out. Hey, hey Lewis, you know, when I look at this chart, it also is interesting to me, and I wonder what you think about that, even when the expectations peak, they only peaked at, you know, below 4%, and we're seeing headline CPI of what, what like 9.6% in the last print. So the market's never really gotten um, gotten to where the, the CPI is and has consistently been discounting that inflation was not going to be as much of a problem as the headline numbers are showing. Is that is that your take on it too? No, I, I think you put your your um, your finger on it exactly. So, you know the other the other thing too, uh, and it, frankly, this is. Um, this is kind of a common theme, you know, you guys are here in your defensively position. One of those reasons is that, frankly, CPI data is, is lagging. You know, the market is a forward-looking mechanism. The market is trying to price in what the world's going to look like in eight to 12 months, basically. And so CPI is kind of what has already happened. So to have the Fed uh, so focused on a backward-looking lagging measure, is, in my opinion, a recipe for volatility. We're already seeing plenty of that. So uh, I don't know, if I were running the Fed, I think I would pay much closer attention to forward-looking uh, measures such as this inflation expectation. So uh, we're on this kind of topic of, of interest rates and so forth. So um, let's take a step back. And so remember, we're kind of talking about kind of how we're positioning, how we're looking in the markets. So uh, one key aspect that I'd like to make clear is that we do believe that there is a inventory stocking underway. We think this is going to lead to a weaker economic growth in the back half of the year. We think this is going to be bullish for higher quality bonds. Um, another point I'd like to make is this is not just... Uh, I mean, this is our opinion, of course, but I wanted to demonstrate that there's a key market that is actually pricing in this reality. Uh, and so this is the euro dollar futures curve. Um, so what this kind of demonstrates, and I'll talk about this in detail in a second, is you can see that there's kind of this um, rapid decline on the left side of this. this that is the, the market um, pricing in a very fast rate of interest rate hikes. What is remarkable, frankly, in my experience, is for that curve to then have that huge bounce in the middle. So you can see that it flex at the bottom that basically begins in early 2023, all the way to 2024 and 25. That upward increase in that line is the market pricing in lower interest rates. So, um, so again, this is a basically a multi-trillion dollar market that trades a tremendous amount every day. Uh, and the market is saying this is a reality. I mean, this is not, uh, you know, you can transact on this basis 24 hours a day. So this is the market basically saying that, uh, that yes, uh, the Fed is going to raise interest rates very meaningfully in the short run. And it's also going to be cutting interest rates meaningfully uh, in you know, six to nine months. 
Uh, and frankly, if you looked at this over time, what you would see is that the market has increasingly brought forward its expectation of what the interest rate decline would begin. If you looked at this just a couple of months ago, the market believed that maybe it was mid to late uh, 2023 that interest rates, short-term interest rates would begin to decline. Uh, now the market is saying at the very beginning of uh, 2023, this is going to begin. So frankly, I think this is an indication that uh, the Fed's a very dramatic interest rate hiking cycle could be causing more problems to the economy than the Fed uh, is willing to acknowledge at this point. So we'll, we'll see. I think it's going to show up in the data pretty soon. And frankly, when I view this in conjunction with uh, the very rapid decline in that scrap price in Turkey, like I said, which is a key indicator for me in terms of what's going on in the real industrial economy, it's one of the key reasons that we are defensively positioned and we do believe that higher quality bonds are going to do well in the back half of this year as the market's basically already, already pricing them in in terms of interest rate cuts in early 2023. Lewis, I think it's a good time. Uh, we have a follow-up question. Uh, perfect timing, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence had a question and it says, um, I have additional question regarding scrap steel. In my former career, I traded scrap steel. Historically, we were exporters to Turkey and Asia. Presently, the US, in the US, we are uh, the high world price. So isn't the cycle different for this time? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Well, well the, the scrap markets are, are very wonderful. And so, um, so to, to talk about Lawrence's point just for a second, um, the reason that we care about the price of scrap steel in Turkey is that um, that the inven uh, is that number one is that uh, scrap steel is a very volatile series that, in our opinion, is the best leading indicator of what takes place in the steel markets. And the steel markets themselves are very volatile that tend to indicate what's taking place in the broader industrial economy. So these are the the logical chain in terms of why I think this is important. And Lawrence makes a key point that. Um, the U.S. is the world's largest steel exporter in terms of scrap steel, and Turkey is the world's largest scrap importer. So, um, so typically, what uh, if you want to know where the price of U.S. scrap is going, you watch what's going on in Turkey because that is setting the world's prices there, the world's biggest import. Um, so, one of the things that's taken place uh, recently, I would say, there's two things that are that in my mind are important. What's going on? The first thing is that scrap price did fall 50 percent in about two months. Uh, number one, which in my opinion uh, is a key inflection point in this inventory cycle. The second point that uh, I think Lawrence is suggesting is that uh, another indicator we watched that I haven't talked about in a while, but it's worth talking about, is that the U.S. steel price is trading at a premium, a very meaningful premium to the rest of the world. This has been a key factor that's frankly kept us cautious on growth ever since mid-2021. And in retrospect, this has been a, a profitable and wise thing for us to be focused on because... Uh, because it's been my experience that these seven inventory, these stocking cycles that I've described to you, that in every instance, they have always, um, you know, kind of run until their conclusion. The conclusion is when the U.S. steel price trades at a discount to the price of steel outside the U.S. And that's for one important reason, which is that the, the way the U.S. ends an oversupply situation in its own market is to be unattractive as an export destination for foreign steel producers. So frankly, the US is still attractive offering kind of a positive arbitrage price to import steel into the US. And so this is this kind of gets back, Bill, I think, to the question you were asking, uh, or maybe it was Ev, about these prior inventory destocking cycles. There's no question we're two months uh, or maybe three months now into this, but uh, that key indicator in the physical steel markets is suggestive to me that even though we've kind of chopped a lot of wood with some very meaningful decelerations in industrial uh, production and so forth, that we haven't really seen the lows there yet, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So here, this talks a little bit about, um, say, how we think about portfolio construction. Um, you know, we've been key believers in the merits of diversification for some time, <laughs> and we're still Believers now, uh, and again, you know, our view, uh, to be clear, is that we do believe that bonds are going to are going to have that valuable role in diversifying equity performance in the back half of this year, as the the slowdown that we've talked about for some time uh, with some of these key indicators that we've outlined really begins to manis manifest itself. And so, if we are correct that we will begin to see a peak in in short term rates in the back half of this year, uh, as the market is already pricing in euro dollars essentially. This is going to be a, a good time to own you know, higher quality bonds that tend to do well um, 
you know, during these decelerations from high uh, inflation prints. So another aspect we think of kind of investing in solutions, talking about the next cycles, winners has to do with uh, an outline, uh, a relationship that we outline here for you, basically that as, uh, as interest rates fall, and in, in this instance, we outline not just uh, uh, falling uh, interest rates, but falling real interest rates. Let me talk about what that is. That's the, um, the after inflation interest rate. So you can calculate this by basically whatever the, the nominal interest rate is, um, you do find the newspaper minus that inflation expectation that the market is pricing in for that same period. So it's the, it's the real or after inflation, inflation adjusted interest rate. So what we demonstrate here in blue is that you've had a dramatic increase in not just uh, nominal interest rates, but real after inflation interest rates. One of the fastest increases in, in quite some time. What's interesting is here we show kind of the, that gold price along it. This is a, an inverse of the gold price chart. So down uh, means kind of a rising price. So hang in there with me on it. But basically what we wanted to demonstrate is that uh, the price of gold does pay attention to and seems to be strongly correlated with what goes on in real interest rates. So um, we've had a almost unparalleled increase in real interest rates. We do believe that's subsiding. It's been my experience, I guess, this is again, uh, Bill talking about say trading inventory destocking cycles. Every inventory destocking cycle I've ever traded does have a decline in real interest rates uh, in it as activity is falling. So um, it, this is another reason why uh, it is our expectation that we will see um, kind of a, a peak and then begin to see a decline in interest rates. The back half of this year is the economy slows. And you know, gold being an indicator of materials, do you see other commodities following suit? Sort of in the next part of the cycle. Well, yeah. So let's so let's talk about that, Bill. It's been our experience that um, <coughs> as um, that one of the key leading indicators for the kind of commodity complex in general is a kind of a strong and rising gold price. So what we do believe is that um, because remember um, because the markets are very forward looking um, and gold is a very forward looking instrument for that reason that as, um, as monetary accommodation goes from being very restrictive where it is right now to more accommodative, that tends to, uh, gold will reflect that future change um, that is driven by the financial change right now, gold reflects that immediately and that the commodity markets will reflect that in time through stronger supply and demand balances. So this is a key reason why when we think about kind of investing in the next cycle's winners, we do believe that uh, that gold will traditionally uh, will hold the same role it has traditionally, which is that it tends to be one of the first things uh, off the blocks in a uh, in a recovery, and that's really driven by what we think is going to be falling real interest rates uh, at some point in the future. So, so that's a key aspect of how we think about again investing in yeah. kind of cycles winners, which uh, which we do think are going to have a very high commodity component. This is just an example that we uh, show for you. That basically, uh, the the blue price, which you can see is <laughs> ruinously high. This is the price of natural gas, liquefied natural gas in Europe, uh, and it's uh, incredibly high. And frankly, I would demonstrate there's no question that Mr. Putin's invasion has played some role here, but you can see that really it was in early 21. That this price began to rise. If you've been following some of our research, you've seen we, we kind of wouldn't shut up about this uh, for the last couple of years. Um, so this is very much, uh, we think, a multi-year problem that is going to take a, a very meaningful campaign of sustained investment to create infrastructure that currently doesn't exist to kind of get lower price natural gas into Europe. We think this is going to be a very feral development for companies that make natural gas, liquefied natural gas and infrastructure for that in states. And this is what we demonstrate with this huge premium uh, in terms of what people are paying overseas, which is basically like $40, $45 relative to the US price, which I think is about six or seven. So we think that's a, a nice multi-year opportunity for companies that can profit from that. Now talking also about um, Investing in solutions, which is a big part of our framework. Um, you know, if you think about um, what a, a deglobalization cycle is really about, it's really the opposite of everything that we've come to know since uh, 1945. So it really is a totally new world in our instance. Uh, and so for that reason, our research is really focused more on the next cycle's winners that may have absolutely nothing to do and look nothing like the uh, leaders of the last cycle 
because of course it's a very different world that they're operating in. So one of those uh, that we're going to highlight is frankly the defense sector because war uh, is of course has made its way to the European uh, shore, which is a development that we haven't seen in 75 years. Um, war is really the ultimate deglobalization event. Uh, and so I think now that, um, that Europe, for instance, is seeing that um, they were unwise to trust their energy security to someone who now has land forces uh, in Europe, that they are trying to diversify away from that. But it would make sense, in my opinion, if, uh, if voters also looked at the world, felt a little scary about it, felt uh, it would be better if they had more defense spending to feel a little safer at home. So I would be willing uh, to bet you that this early development that we're seeing in terms of outperformance of the defense stocks, that should this fundamental trend continue of, of higher defense spending now that, that basically, you know, war is um, a real thing again. Um, you know, frankly, I think that uh, one of the benefits of a deglobalization cycle are, are companies that are providing that solution to voters. And the other thing that's interesting is that defense stocks are interesting in that as their revenue goes up with higher defense spending, their margins are pretty much locked in to rise. And so competition isn't really gonna be an issue for them. They are gonna grow earnings. They, they, they pretty much behave like utilities where the government contracts, it's a cost plus sort of thing where um, they, they're, their costs are, are passed through to the government and their margins stay high. So that's a, another reason to really like this business as its revenue, as its top line revenue goes yeah, up. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point, Zev. And I would expand on that a little further, like just a, a simple a simple way to maybe tell the story would be if, if I had a rich uncle and I inherited a hundred billion dollars from him uh, and I felt like um, I wanted to kind of take that money and build a missile defense system with it, or if I wanted to, um, you know, create like the new platform fighter for, uh, you know, the uh, American military. I mean, the, the government would not be entertaining me just no matter the fact that I had a hundred billion dollar checkbook behind me uh, because, uh, you know, there's all the systems, there's all the security clearances. You know, one of the aspects that, that you tend to see of a higher quality business is it does have what we call kind of barriers, you know, to entry. And certainly the defense sector, uh, has those key aspects. And the final point about this that I'll make, it's been my experience that um, when you have a business that has one of these higher quality profiles, and then it kind of discovers unanticipated growth, such as from an unexpected upcycle, those can be very meaningful performers, which is why a favorable outlook on many companies in the defense sector. Well, Lewis, we, we've come to the takeaways of the day and maybe I'll kind of walk through them and you can comment. Uh, and then we have a couple of questions that I'm sure that we'll have here toward the end. I mean, the big big picture to today is that there's a new trend of deglobalization underway around the world. Uh, the cycle that will be the new cycle will have a different set of winners than, than the old cycle. So if you think back over the last several years, we've had you know large mega cap tech uh, kind of dragging us along the way in a wonderful time of, of up markets. Uh, it's unlikely that that sector will still be the, the winner in the new. So we're looking for the opportunities of what we believe will be the new winners going forward. Um, there's certainly volatility in the markets. Uh, volatility is natural. As the markets progress from that old cycle, uh, the globalization to the new cycle of deglobalization, you can expect more volatility. Um, we will remain defensively positioned during the time of the transition. That does not mean we're hiding under the, under the, uh, the mattress. It just means that we are defensively positioned and looking for the opportunities in, in, in sort of what we believe will be the new winners in the new cycle. Mm -hmm. And the new problems presented by deglobalization will appear. Uh, they will demand solutions. Companies that can profitably provide the solutions will be rewarded by the market. Uh, we think defense companies, commodities, uh, sustainable growth companies will do very well in this, in this new cycle. So you can look for expressions of that in your portfolios and more discussions as we go along. Um, Lewis, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, no, no, no. I, I would just, I think it's a really good summary, Bill. I would just, um, just kind of add that, um, you know, investing could be a simple business and that, you know, society progresses through solutions and, um, you know, the market is uh, one of the things that it does very well is kind of reward, uh, companies that can profitably 
provide solutions that move society ahead. So a big part of our research process is to take a look at the world, see the kind of problems that we believe are going to need to get solved to move society ahead, and then find the companies that are profitably creating solutions for that. Um, and so really that's, <laughs> in, in a very brief summary, is what our research effort is trying to do. So if we're correct that uh, we are really in this new deglobalized world, that means that we, society needs a whole new set of solutions. And we think this is great uh, for fundamental research guys uh, like us, because this gives us the ability to kind of go out, roll our sleeves up and, um, and kind of dream of, of a new world of what that looks like and the companies who are going to help, you know, create those solutions. So we think it's um, going to be a wonderful time in terms of, you know, our ability to kind of um, add value relative to the markets. Um, so we frankly couldn't be more excited about it, but we do believe that we have to continue to have our emphasis on risk management. Um, so as we come to the q and I have a, a final question, I think, here from Rich. It's kind of a statement and a question mixed in. It says, yes, real interest rates should fall in the context of an economy slowing, but real rates are incredibly low in a historical context. Lewis, are we in a, a new normal of lower rates, or is this something that's in, uh, you know temporary? Oh, look, well, that, that, that's a great question. And I know Rich is uh, kind of quite a scholar of, of history. Um, you know, there are quite a few studies, I don't have them, you know, at hand, that have kind of demonstrated that, frankly, over kind of a multi-century view, that there has been a, a gradual decline in kind of real interest rates. Um, but, you know, I would, I would maybe think about that in, in a couple of ways. There was, I would argue that the very high real interest rates of the early 1980s were, frankly, um, anomalous. If you go back, you look at the last two or 300 years, there frankly was no such thing as sustainable real interest rates. It was just this uh, anomalous period that began uh, when the back of inflation got uh, broken um, in the early 1980s in the, in the U.S., that before there was no discernible pattern, frankly. The other um, kind of heuristic that I would suggest perhaps is that um, if we uh, were exiting a world where there had been a tremendous amount of malinvestment, money wasted in, uh, in things that could not earn a return, a future return, such as people borrowing money to go on vacation or something rather than borrowing money to build a factory that makes widgets is going to pay itself back. Then if, uh, if we were exiting a period of malinvestment, you would think that the opportunity for capital to earn a reasonable return in real terms would be uh, circumscribed until we can kind of work through those problems. So uh, frankly, uh, there's no question that, that interest rates are low and that real interest rates um, are also low. They've been uh, far lower, you know, just one small example. And, and actually this is maybe worth expanding upon. Um, one of the examples I would like to highlight is that if you, if you go back and you look at the period of the 1920s, which was kind of a disinflationary growth period that was a very favorable period for owning um, you know, financial assets, that basically once um, real interest rates got um, very high for the temporary period of the, the shock of kind of the Great Depression, especially from say 1930 to 1933, this kicked off a wave of, of deleveraging, which was people paying uh, debts down um, because asset prices were falling and confidence was low. So one of the things that, that, that helped drive both real and nominal interest rates lower from that, uh, that initial shock was the fact that people were paying down debts from an exceedingly high level. Well, debts are exceptionally two or three times as high now as they were back then relative to say uh, gross domestic product, GDP, GNP, for instance. So one of the things that frankly, um, if you know, perhaps my biggest long-term concern really has to do with uh, if we are say tipping over from a period in time where we're confident people were borrowing and using that SS borrowing power to buy things, if, uh, if they lose that confidence and people begin to pay down debts on a sustained basis, similar to what they did in the, in the 30s and 40s, that that really that uh, threatens locking us in a lower growth world because we don't have the future to borrow uh, from because we are paying down debts. And so, frankly, this is one of the reasons that uh, our bias has been uh, to be, uh, you know, more kind of long term bullish 
on, let's say, bonds than <laughs> maybe almost anybody else that we know, uh, you know, for that, uh, for that reason. But yeah, anyway, that's... Every time we get an interest rate question, it takes me back to 2013 in May when you moved to Naples and you're unpacking your boxes in the office and you pulled out this ragtag giant book and you wanted to share with me that you had the world history of interest rates. And uh, uh, so, so Lewis is a student of interest rates uh, and, and it always gets him going when we talk about them. So I appreciate that. Uh, well, that history okay. so go read, go read Homer's history of interest rates, Sidney Homer, who was the... Uh, Created. Nobody other than you can find a copy of that. Yes, yes, yes. So that brings us to our last question of the day. It comes from Bob. And Lewis is a sort of a question on a, a previous slide. So would you please expound on why sustainable companies will be winners in a deglobalization cycle? Well, uh, thanks for the question. So let me be clear. What we're talking about is kind of sustainable growth uh, companies. And so here our focus is not, um, let's say, e ESG driven uh, but a sustainability in terms of the ability of a company to continue to, uh, to earn robust returns almost regardless of the economic environment. So, for instance, one of the investments or one form of investment we've been favoring for some time is, is kind of been what you call the staple sector. Where these are, are kind of branded uh, goods companies or companies that are otherwise providing uh, items that we kind of consume every day. Uh, and so uh, if, if companies, you know, have, have built strong businesses in providing these things that are kind of necessities, we think that there's going to be demand for that kind of regardless. And so if you don't overpay for those kind of sustainable businesses, which is what I mean, then we think that can be a very reasonable investment for kind of a challenged world. Great. Well, thanks, Lewis. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time today. Uh, we have the contact information. If you have follow-up questions, please feel free to email us at info at capitalwealthadvisors.com. You can follow our research publications uh, and our social media, uh, as well as on our website under the insight section. Uh, we have begun to introduce uh, some new voices um, from some of our advisors that are helping us write pieces. Um, so be sure to take an opportunity to look at those. Uh, John Walker has been very helpful on the planning side recently in publishing. If you haven't had a chance to look at the wisdom and wealth, that's there. Lewis is also putting out a new three and three uh, series with some short tidbits about what he's looking at on his Bloomberg on a daily basis. So be sure to follow those as well. We look forward to seeing you on future market happy hours and I uh, hope everybody is having a great summer and we will see you next time. Thanks everybody.